When I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was sick, did you take care of me? When I was in prison, did you visit me? When I was homeless, did you bring me in? If we find ourselves climbing the ladder of success, we better be careful because on our way up, we might pass Jesus on His way down. Because it's all Jesus one that was coming to call us into the pain and the suffering of the world. And, and so I wanted that kind of faith. I wanted a faith that like got into the pain of the world. I grew up down in Tennessee in you know, what a lot of us call the Bible Belt. Some of us even said Tennessee might be the buckle of it. And I was a real, real uh, good kid. I, I, I made straight A's and uh, wore nice clothes. and I was prom king. It was a small town. And uh, uh, I can remember growing up in, in the church and hearing about how God loved me. And, and I, I'm so thankful that, I, unlike, I mean, not everybody has that experience, but I had the experience of growing up in the church that people loved me well. And I began to understand that uh, there's a God that loves me and, and loves the whole world. And I saw Southern hospitality. I had a mom and grandparents that just took such good care of people. And um, my dad died when I was a kid, but I, I learned um, to love for my family. I was an only child and an only grandchild, so some might argue that I was a little spoiled, but I, uh, I, I definitely felt loved. And that helped me, I think, to, to receive uh, th this message that there's a God that loves me. And I can remember going on a little retreat uh, with my youth group, and they gave an altar call for us to kind of give our lives at the altar to God and dedicate them to God. And, uh, and I did it, you know, tears rolling down my face and everything. And then uh, the next summer we went again and uh, we did it again. It was so good the first time. I, 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 we got born again, again every year, like every summer we'd go. And then there kind of came a point where we said, there's got to be more to this thing than just getting born again, again every year. And there, there's got to be more than just believing in Jesus. Because as I started reading the scripture, I got the sense that Jesus didn't just come to make believers, but to form disciples. And I, and I saw that we can believe in Jesus and, and still not have our lives change or look much different. And, and, and uh, so I, as I started reading the words of Jesus, like the Sermon on the Mount, and the Beatitudes, it started to mess with me. I mean, I, I, I saw the things that I was running after and, and they weren't always the same things that I saw Jesus uh, telling us to do. And, and so there kind of came a moment where I felt this kind of collision in me. And there's people out there, you know, that tell me all the time, uh, my life was such a mess and then I met Jesus and everything came together. I'm like, God bless you. For me, I pretty much had my life together and I met Jesus and He messed me up. And, and I've been kind of recovering from that ever since because I saw Jesus saying, if you want to be the greatest, then you should become the least. I started wondering why I was working so hard to be the greatest. I went to college outside of Philly and uh, I guess, you know, when you're, when you're in college and you're young or you're in high school and you're young, like you haven't been convinced that things are impossible which is a gift, and that was our case. We thought, we want to learn how to follow Jesus. Who's really doing it? And uh, Mother Teresa was still alive at the time, and she seemed to be giving the old, you know, this gospel way of life a pretty good shot. So we wrote her a letter and ended up calling her on the phone. She picked up the phone. We said, we want to come to India. And so bam, bam, before long, we were in Calcutta and working alongside of Mother Teresa and the sisters. And one of the things that I learned is this incredible reality that we are to be the body of Christ. That, you know, I'd heard a lot of language that, oh, we're the body of Christ, that's what the church is or whatever. But when, it, when I was in India, I, I learned about that in a way that was so beautiful because um, in the mornings, every morning we would get up really early and we would kneel down before the cross, but we would pray these prayers that were about Jesus living in us and through us, that our hands would become Christ's hands. And you had this real sense that, uh, that th these sisters believed that, that they were going to be an extension of Jesus' love in the world. 
And, and I started to read some scriptures like when Paul says that the life I live, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And I started to see where John's gospel says uh, that we'll do the same things Jesus has been doing and even greater things than Jesus did because Christ lives in us. And you think, my gosh, what would the world look like if we, if we actually began to pray and invite Christ through the Spirit to live in us and through us every day? It's also why Mother Teresa wanted to take communion every morning. She wanted to do the Eucharist, to have the communion feast every morning. But that's different, you know, especially at five in the morning. What were we doing taking communion? And one of the sisters said, well, you heard the saying, you are what you eat, right? And she said, that's what we're praying, is that we would become what we eat, that Christ would be digested, the body and the blood would run through us so that we would be a part of Christ's body or maybe that we would be digested into who Christ is in the world. Mother Teresa had a great line. She used to say, Calcuttas are everywhere if we we'll only have eyes to see. You don't have to go to Calcutta to find Calcutta. She would say, you need to find your Calcutta. Pray that God would give you the eyes to see those who are ostracized and outcasts, the lonely, the marginalized, the, those who are, 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 are needing to feel God's love and hear the whisper of God's grace. And then you become the hands and feet of Christ to them. If we look closely into the eyes of our neighbors and of those who suffer, we will find Jesus in his most distressing disguises. And she said that's one of the wildest things you'll ever see is as you hold the, the hand of a dying person or you hold the, the hand of a homeless person, you look in their eyes and sometimes you feel Christ staring back at you. I love how there's an old guy named Carl Bart that said we got to read the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. And I think what he was saying was we can't just use our faith as a ticket into heaven and ignore the hells of the world around us, but we got to we got to use our faith as a, as a uh, co compelling us to, to do something about the things that are wrong in the world. And it was while I was studying all that in college that I read in the newspaper about a group of homeless families uh, here in a neighborhood called Kensington that they uh, had gotten together. And these were mostly moms and children that, that didn't ha have homes. And they in desperation they found an abandoned cathedral and they started living in it. So as they're living in this abandoned cathedral while they're trying to find permanent housing, uh, we read in the newspaper this story and it ended by saying that the Catholic, the, the archdiocese that owned the cathedral had given them 48 hours to get out. And if they weren't out within two days they could be arrested for trespassing on church property. We found that troubling. You know, and there's kind of those moments where you throw your hands up at God and you go, God, why don't you do something? And we sort of felt God say, I did do something. I made you. And I think sometimes we sit around waiting on God and God might be waiting on us and, and, and wanting us to respond to injustice. So we were compelled and we got involved in that struggle with those families. They became our friends and opened our eyes to so much of the inequities and injustices that happen in our world and uh, in a lot of ways we never really left that old church and all kinds of things happened many of those families got housing and uh, it was in that old cathedral that we began to read the the story of the early church where it says everybody shared everything they had no one claimed any of their possessions were their own and it says and there were no needy persons among them and I, I kind of find it ironic that it was in the ruins of an old abandoned cathedral that our vision for the church was ignited. Uh, we, we, we sort of came at a point where we said, we're going to stop complaining about the church that we, we may have experienced and work on becoming the church that we dream of. So we've been living here ever since. And uh, uh, it was in that old cathedral, I think, that I also began to wrestle with this this real reality that we are born again and that's not just some kind of spiritual language that we use but if we believe that we're born again we've got brothers and sisters that are not biological but they're they're brothers and sisters nonetheless and some of them are hungry some of them are lonely some of them are suffering and that should affect us 
just as if our own biological family were suffering. And so if one person is on the street, it should keep us up at night. And, and, and so we've been wrestling with this idea of what it means to love our neighbor as ourself ever since. Our neighborhood here in Kensington is a uh, old industrial town, so we, we, we've got all these uh, factories and row houses, and, and uh, they say if you take an aerial view of our neighborhood, you can see that it was kind of like a village. It was a school and a cathedral and a factory, and the row houses were all built around it, and uh, everybody kind of lived together. And now, over the past few decades, those factories have moved out, and we've lost uh, nearly 200,000 jobs. We've got 700 abandoned factories. We've got over 20,000 abandoned houses, abandoned lots. There's a lot of abandonment. And, and a lot of folks in Philadelphia call my neighborhood the Badlands. But I always say, you better, you better be careful if you call a place the Badlands, because that's exactly what they said in Nazareth. Nothing good can come out of there. And look what showed up. So we believe in resurrection. We believe that dead things can be brought to life. We believe that ugly things can be made beautiful. And that's what we get to practice. For us, resurrection isn't just something that happened 2,000 years ago, but something that uh, uh, we get to participate in every day. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead and rose from that cross that exposed everything ugly in the world, it, it was a triumph of love over hatred, of life over death, and that should affect the way that we live now. So our big question is, is what would it look like if God's dream came to our neighborhood? What would it look like if God's dream came to your neighborhood? What would it look like if, if God's most perfect dream for the earth was realized and then we get to participate in it? So what we like to do here is, is bring dead things back to life, love dead people back to life, and, and, and always be reminded that nothing is beyond redemption. My name is Shane Claiborne. This is the truth, and I dare you to live it.